Good morning, church. We are glad that you're here. Those of you who are present physically and those of you who are watching online, I know it's a, a kind of a wet gray day and uh, there's every reason to be in uh, under the covers. But uh, for those of you all who are home and worshiping, uh, thank you. And those of you who are here, I uh, very much appreciate your presence. It's uh, really hard to be a Christian alone, right? We need each other, and our Lord Jesus Christ knew that. That's why community was created. That's why the church is here, and we journey together, and we, uh, we live our life as faithfully as possible with God's help. A couple of announcements before we begin worship this morning. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm looking around, and uh, is, is that you, Elwood? Hold on. <laughs> hold on. Who's in the front row? That's impressive, but I, I think my body resemblance is better to Jake. Than <laughs> so, uh, it, it, luckily, it was not 106 miles to Chicago, but over the last two weeks, it has felt like it's been about 10,000 miles for me on the road uh, doing my shows. Uh, first of all, real quick, to thank you all very much for receiving us, my wife and I, as members of <laughs> faith. My wife, Lori, is a wound and ostomy um, nursing supervisor at Blake Memorial Hospital, and she works most of the weekend. So hopefully she will be able to join us uh, live and in person uh, when we have our, our weekday type activities. But in addition to that, she is looking forward to being an active member of this. And I, I, I speak for her only because I'm forced to after, uh, <laughs> being married for 42 years so uh, but uh, no we, we are very excited to be here as you can tell I love themes when I talked to Pastor Eric yesterday told him about my adventures out on the road felt like uh, I'm truly on a mission from God and uh, and so that that is kind of where this all started tomorrow at 2 p.m. We will begin our comedy, uh, what we are calling our, and here's get where I get to change. You guys will find out over the years, I love themes, okay? So, you are going to become comedy craftsmen. <laughs> How about that? We are going to start building you tomorrow uh, at 2 o'clock if you are interested in being a part of this. Even if you do not want to appear on stage, it is a great opportunity to uh, uh, learn some new skills, learn some fun ways to, to communicate, uh, not only in public, but with your families, and, and have some fun where, you know, we've proven in so many ways that, that God really does have a sense of humor, and I know that from my own personal uh, uh, craziness of, of life that he, he has to. So we will, be, we will meet for about 90 minutes on Mondays at 2 p.m. It'll go from about 2 to 3.30 to the 4 o'clock up on the second floor wing. Wow, you guys even have a second floor wing uh, of the church. And uh, uh, all I need you to do tomorrow is if you are interested in being a part of it, just show up. Uh, we are just going to do an introductory time tomorrow, and if it is something that you can want to continue on, then we are going to guide you through, and believe it or not, we are going to have on Holy Humor Sunday, which is April the 7th, look, mark it on your calendars, folks, uh, we are going to have the first graduating class of the Faith Lutheran Comedy craftsman class and they will be up here to perform their stand-up comedy for you and uh, we'll just say it like this real quickly uh, if they say anything that remotely sounds funny you'll need to laugh well so <laughs> so you know Al they they laugh at my jokes already so they are very gracious and merciful yeah I've, I've heard a couple of them and <laughs> 
we know the redemptive power here. So, uh, no, I am kidding you. But uh, I look forward to being with you all over the next six weeks and uh, look forward to uh, being an active member of this great congregation. And uh, we, we're, we're so happy to be here. So knock on uh, plastic. We'll have some folks. We've already got 10 confirmed that are from outside of the church. And I'll have you know this very quickly. Three of those folks are in my comedy community, and I can tell you, in their adult lives, they have never stepped foot in a church. And uh, I, I think it is, I think this is the perfect place for them to see what church is really all about, right? So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So anyway, thank you all very Thanks, much. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Al. Okay, very important announcement. Next week, we will have one service because we have our annual meeting. So next week, 9 o'clock. I know you're saying that's way early. It is. It is. Uh, but this way, you'll come to worship. We'll have the meeting right afterwards. We, there's a couple things we need you to vote on, our budget, and we have to elect a couple people to council and other things. We need your help. So please come and be part of that very special week, 9 o'clock next week. Uh, be here for worship, okay? Uh, thank you very much. I'll announce it again. We'll send out reminders, but it is very important. Also, during Wednesdays during Lent, we had a beautiful Ash Wednesday celebration to get us into this uh, journey toward Easter together. Um, it is a, a very special time in the church year. So uh, every Wednesday, uh, we will have a service here at noon. We'll, it'll go from 12 to 12.30. But afterwards, our kitchen crew, uh, led by Karen Audley and uh, with some awesome volunteers, are creating a really nourishing lunch experience for us. And we'll be able to gather together for fellowship. So you're going to feed your your mind, your heart, your soul, and your body. And uh, it's uh, a great and wonderful time uh, to be church. So because of that, our bereavement group shifts time. It goes to 10.30. So if you're in the bereavement group, no longer at 1 o'clock, but at 10.30 a.m. during the season of Lent, just like we did during uh, Advent, for those of you who are already part of the group. And uh, please know that if you're grieving or if you know someone that's grieving, they can join the group at any time. Just tell them to please come or bring them with you, even if you are not actively grieving, just to, to bring a friend to the group if you can serve as that bridge. Uh, there are other announcements, but you can read them. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, ask me. Instead, I think what we'll do at this point is we'll yield to a time for the children. But... I don't know how many we have here. If you're feeling like a kid, come forward. Uh, feeling uh, remotely young. Uh, but uh, we, uh, I see we have a few. Okay, there's Christian. Okay, good, 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 good. Hey, come on down as I see some others. Come on down. Come on down. Okay, you could stay there. You don't have to. Nobody's forced. All right, Deborah is feeling young. She's down here too. Okay, wonderful. Come, grab a seat. I'm going to sit with you today. So, I have a question for, for you guys, and my question is, um, have you ever been maybe scared? Yeah, when? Okay, you were on a roller coaster at Bush Gardens? <laughs> were you scared before you got online? And you got online anyway? Why? Because you were determined to do it. You saw that people went on and they came off. <laughs> and you were convinced that you would come off, right? All right, that's kind of cool. How about you, Christian? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, you know, from you figured that uh, scientists designed it and, like, they know what they're doing. But when you're on that first initial drop, you kind of wonder, right? Did they really <laughs> test this as good as they said? Um, yeah, roller coasters are scary. What about being, a, being all alone? How about getting lost? That ever happened to you guys? 
One time you got lost? Uh huh. How did it feel when you were lost for that little bit of time? You're looking around, you couldn't find your dad or your sister, and, and it made you feel kind of afraid, right? I had an a experience, too, of being lost when I was a kid, um, and uh, it scared me, uh, and I still remember it. Sometimes I even have, like, a dream about it, you know? You know, when you get older, sometimes you can feel like uh, you're lost even though you're with people. You can feel like you kind of lost your way, and that can kind of be scary, too, And uh, God reminds us, and today the gospel lesson that you're going to learn in Sunday school, but the one that we're going to hear too, it reminds us of something really important that we forget, and that is that God is always close. God is always close. I remember a time when I was in Japan, and I was working really hard, and it was a I was kind of lost during that time. I wasn't lost like I knew where I was, you know, I didn't, you know, but I felt like um, I really didn't have very many friends. I was working all the time and I felt like I was out of place. I didn't feel really good. And then I remembered that I could call on God. So you know what I did? I started to talk to God more, pray more. Um, spend time in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And something amazing happened. I, uh, I felt better. And I didn't feel lost at all. Even though I, all the rest of the situation was the same. I was still working hard and everything else. But I was calm and at peace. So today we're going to learn about Jesus in the wilderness. And uh, he's very much at peace being there. Because he knows that his father, God, is near, right? So can you pray with me? Pray with me. Almighty God, help us to always remember that you are close to us. Help us to remember we can call upon you and we can trust in you. Help us not to forget this really important truth. And help, it, help that truth to give us peace especially when we are not feeling so peaceful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So God bless you, okay? Have a great time in Sunday school. I know you will, all right? And we'll see you for communion. God bless. At this time, I invite the congregation to please rise and uh, give your attention to my dear colleague and brother, Pastor Larry, as he leads us in the word. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law in our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. So held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save. And defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood you saved the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation you protected your Son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, that is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
sins of my youth and my transgressions. Remember me according to your steadfast love and for the sake of your goodness, O oh Lord. You are gracious and upright, O oh Lord. Therefore you teach sinners in A reading from 1 Peter. Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Word of God. Word of life. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven you are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts. And the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you O Christ. Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So Sven Svensson, already, <laughs> relocated from Minnesota, where he was a very pious uh, Haugian Lutheran, to Maryland in a very Roman Catholic neighborhood. And uh, Lent rolled around, and on Friday, uh, he decided, Sven, that he was going to have a nice steak. So he puts a steak on the grill, and it's starting to waft through the neighborhood. 
Well, all the men in the neighborhood really got upset. They're calling each other on the phone. They're like, what are we going to do? We have this new neighbor, Sven. We can't eat meat on Friday. We're eating cold tuna fish. He's grilling a steak. This is not right. <laughs> so they waited it out. Every Friday during Lent, this same thing happened. So they had a meeting after Easter, and they said, we, we got to work on Sven. So they brought him to the Knights of Columbus, and they all said how much they appreciated him, and he felt so a part of their group that they said, come, join our church. And he goes, sure, I'll be a Catholic. So he goes to Mass with them, and the priest is there, and sprinkles him with holy water, and says, you were born a Lutheran, you were raised a Lutheran, but now you're a Catholic. They figured they solved the whole problem. Everything's going to be fine. And of course, next Lent, the first Friday of Lent, they thought they were smelling something. But it was Sven, and he had another steak on the grill. So they all came to his door, and they got there just in time to see him. He had a pitcher of water, and he was dousing it with water while it was on the grill. And he said, you were born a cow. You were raised a cow, and now you're a fish. <laughs> it's an old joke. I've told it many times, but it's my favorite Lenten joke. But brothers and sisters, temptation is no joke, right? And it comes at a time when we're not expecting it. There's all different kinds of temptations that we face. You know, one of them is uh, to really question and doubt God's presence in different times. And that happens, uh, well, this morning I, I got some news from a friend. I served at uh, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church and school in Nassau County in Long Island. And uh, the congregation uh, did something awesome uh, back a uh, few decades uh, prior to my serving. Uh, they had a big piece of land. They um, basically partnered with the, the uh, municipality there, the town of Oyster Bay, to uh, create housing, low-income housing for seniors, the Shepherd Hill Apartments, right? So when I was serving there, we would minister to them. We would be there all the time. I knew them. They were great. Well, this morning they had a horrible fire, and one of the buildings was completely destroyed, about 80 of the occupants were transported. Firemen were hurt. At least one fatality. Probably will be more. And it's moments like that where, you know, you, you wonder, right? Where, where's God? You know, I, of course, I know where God is. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't destabilize you a little bit in your faith journey. You've all had experiences like that also, right? You get sick, someone else gets sick. Uh, something unexpected happens, which really just rocks your world and puts you in a place where you start to question all different things. And I think that's when we're vulnerable like that. That's when we're most likely to submit to temptation. The temptation of trusting something else other than God. Now, I know basically we'll find out what happened with that fire, right? Uh, somebody was probably using a space heater. It's freezing cold there right now. And they weren't, uh, you know, they had too much clutter. Something happened. It's a logical reason God didn't do it. And thank God for the firefighters that were there and they really did save a lot of people's lives, and that's all good. But, you know, you can probably do that with many, many things. But in our moments of weakness, we look to other places to try to hedge our bets or try to self-insure that we'll, we will be okay. But all of that is vanity. It's a puff of wind. It doesn't really, we can't do it. We can't insulate ourselves from death. We can't insulate ourselves from tragedy. We can't insulate ourselves from illness. So what, what is this day that's dedicated toward Jesus in the wilderness all about? 
Well, I'd like to take you all the way back to Genesis, the, the human experiment, right? In that beautiful narrative story that we have in Genesis of the, the first human beings created in God's image, the Adam, they are in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is unlike any other place on earth. It is a place where heaven and earth come together, where the earth and the sky touch. It's a place where there are angels and there are wild beasts. And yet, humankind, made in God's image, sons and daughters of God, Adam and Eve, they are ones that have dominion over the animals. The wild beast. There's no fear there of the wild beast. And the angels, there's no fear of the angels. They are there, also God's servants. And God even visited the, the garden in the cool of the day, would walk among Adam and Eve, be present with them. And of course, you know the story, what happens. They are told to give their allegiance to God who created them who gave them life, who breathed the power of life into them. And instead, they give their allegiance to a beast, to Hasatan, to the tempter, who puts in their head and in their heart that there's another way, tempts them, saying, you can be like God if you do this. And they listen. From that point on, Adam and Eve are cast out east of Eden. The wild beasts are something to fear. And the angels even are something to fear. Because if you remember, the tree of life that's in the garden is now protected. And it's guarded by a, a seraph and a flaming sword. And that's not all. That uh, infection of sin, the disease of embracing another allegiance than the one to Almighty God leads to all sorts of destruction. Cain killing his brother and being cast out even further into a wilderness. And from that point on, the story has been a hard story. It's a story about God continuing to try to call the people to faithfulness and the people of God continuing to fail time and time again. It got so bad that we hear of the flood story. And then God says, no, that's not going to happen again. Here's a rainbow. But even after that, even after the exodus, when the people of God are led back from Egypt, from being slaves, through the Red Sea to the Promised Land. They're in the desert for 40 years. It's a short trip, should have took a little bit of time, but they continued to sin, choose other gods, making idols. And that brings us to today, right? I keep on going, keep on going. We do the same thing, don't we? But between then and now, something amazing happened. Jesus, God's own son, came, the incarnation. God made a way where there was no way, found a way to reconcile his people, found a way for us to be faithful even though we're wayward. And Jesus goes to the river Jordan. He's baptized by John. He hears that he is God's beloved, in whom God is well pleased. He sees the Spirit of the Lord descending like a dove upon him. He sees the heavens torn open. And immediately, he is cast out. The verb is really strong there, ekbalo. He is cast out into the wilderness to be tested. Now, Mark's gospel account is very short, not like Matthew's, which gives you all these different temptations, one for food, right, where Jesus answers with Scripture. 
Uh, you, you, man does not live by bread alone, but by uh, God's word. And, and then uh, there's another temptation there for, for fame and uh, one for power, appealing to vanity, appealing to this human need to be in charge. But here we just have simply, he was tempted and there was wild beasts. Now, I don't know about you, I, as I was talking with the young people during our children's sermon, I, um, I've been very afraid a couple times in life, very afraid. You might say, ah, oh, maybe it was a fire. No, 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 no. They all involved wild beasts. The first time I was in Japan, I befriended a person that was having a really hard time. And I, I met him uh, at a, a bar stool. I was a student there. And uh, I, I saw that he was really having a hard time. So I just kind of talked with him and helped him through it. And all of a sudden, one day he comes in. And he goes, I want to invite you to the opening of my restaurant. I'm like, okay. So I go downtown Osaka, this huge restaurant. This guy's the owner. I never would have guessed it. I'm the guest of honor. He gets up and he gives a speech, which I could half understand at the time. But basically, he attributed to me to saving his life. So people clapped, I sat down, and then everyone watched as the sushi chef prepared a fugu for me out of the tank. Fugu is a Japanese puffer fish, which is highly toxic, and lots of people die every year when they eat this thing, and it's been prepared in, in the wrong way. I did not know this guy, really. I did not know his sushi chef. I do not know what his training was. I just knew that that fugu was very poisonous. So they cut it all up, and there it is. What am I going to do? I prayed. <laughs> prayed a lot. And I ate the fugu. And I didn't die. So that was good. Another time, I was also in Japan. These things happen in Japan. I was in Shodoshima in the south. I was uh, having a nice time seeing the sights. And I was attacked by wild monkeys that came out of the, the forest. I was only saved because the person I was with was smart enough to throw candy. And the monkeys ran after the candy and I made a break for it. <laughs> I still have a very bad monkey phobia if you really want to get me. <laughs> Dress in a monkey suit. And uh, the worst um, thing was, as a kid, I, 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 on my block, I was a paper boy, right? So I had my paper out and fold my papers. And uh, we had, a lot of people had dogs, and the dogs were usually chained in their backyard, and the dogs would always get out, and the dogs had this uh, really, really refined palate for paper boy. <laughs> they, they loved the taste of paper boy. So um, I got bit several times. Uh, so I'm still, if a dog is off a leash and it's a big dog, I'm not doing so good. I'm like a little boy again. And I'll never forget, Lisa was here at the earlier service and I recalled it. She remembered, we were uh, at my parents, um, uh, we had like a family summer house in the country. And uh, we were um, there, uh, Lisa and I, uh, we were newly married. And we'd taken a walk and the dogs that were loose would pack up. And a whole pack of dogs come around the corner, big dogs, and they're barking and they look mean. And I just froze and closed my eyes and <laughs> held Lisa's hand. And I said, I know if I open my eyes, I'm gonna, they're going to know I'm afraid and I'm going to get bit. So Lisa's just like, get out of here, get out of here. And they left. I go, is it, is it safe? Is it safe? She said, yes. She goes, I thought you were like this big, tough guy. I go, yeah, I know. <laughs> now when it comes to dogs, we're, good thing we're already married, right? What we see with Jesus here in this wilderness, the wild beasts are around, but they're not attacking Jesus. Uh, this is like um, a reflection of what we see in the book of Daniel. We, this is a part of the peaceable kingdom. Jesus is doing something. He is restoring God's created order back to the way it was supposed to be before Adam and Eve started to listen to the beast. In listening to God, in trusting in God, in being centered in God, the beasts are not a threat. And the angels waited on him. 
Now, in Mark's gospel, I love the fact that it doesn't define what the temptations are, just that Satan is tempting him. Because our temptations are very different, but we all have them, and we all succumb to them. None of us can maintain our allegiance to God wholeheartedly, not in our own power. It's impossible. George Parker was uh, an infamous uh, uh, swindler. He um, went to New York City, set up shop, and uh, he forged all sorts of documents and uh, sold almost all of the landmarks in New York City over and over again, the most famous being the Brooklyn Bridge. And he made a lot of money. Because people always want something that they can't have. We want things that we can't have or we shouldn't have. And what, what is that about? Like, what is out there that's so great that is better than leaning in to God's promises completely? What is it that someone else can provide or that I myself can provide that is better than what God provides? Lent is a time for us to reflect on that. Why are we so restless? Why can't we be settled and at, be at peace? They say when you think you don't have enough, when you are succumbing to this view of scarcity, that your IQ level drops 13 points. You make bad decisions when you think you're going to run out, run out of money, run out of food, run out of friends, run out of time, run out of time. Social scientists will tell you, if you feel like you don't have time in your life, the best thing to do is to take some time off and do nothing. As a pastor, I tell you, if you feel overwhelmed by your schedule and the pressure that you have in life, take time off from everything and be with the Lord in a wilderness place. That's why... Retreats are so powerful. You ever go on a retreat, right? You come back charged. You feel centered. Why? Because you got back to your center, to that which matters. In the lesson from 1 Peter, we are reminded again that baptism is so essential for us. It's not only the, the washing and the cleansing of sin, which baptism does, but it is this reminder that something remarkable has happened to me, and therefore I have an assurance from God that everything is going to be okay. How often do we forget that, right? We panic. We try to solve the unsolvable. Martin Luther, who we commemorate today uh, with our music and uh, in our prayers, he was fond of saying that in baptism, the old Adam and Eve drown. They die. And we are born again in baptism into a new creature in Christ. And we have to remind ourselves over and over and over again of that truth. It's a daily process. Because if we forget to remind ourselves, soon we will be up to our old tricks of humanity, trying to solve our own problems in our own broken ways, looking to hedge our bets, and we will be miserable.
the one thing I think that Jesus knew and that we forget is that God is always near. In this short passage we have in the gospel, Jesus is in the waters. God is near. God's voice is there. The dove descends. Even Jesus, after he's cast out by the Spirit into the wilderness, he knows God is there. Because the beasts are calm and the angels are ministering to him. When he's out doing his ministry after he hears of John's arrest and he goes to Galilee, he tells people, the kingdom of God has come near. It's here. When we forget that, everything falls apart. When we remember that, no matter what our situation, we can stand strong. We can sit tall. Or we can relax. I've shared this with some of you, but one of the most profound examples in my ministry of this was it was an older woman. Uh, she was widowed. And she wasn't a member of my parish. She was in the community. She did not have a, um, a church, uh, but she had 11 children. And seven of them were police officers. They didn't visit her too often. Their lives were busy. They had a lot of kids. She was alone a lot. But because I did a lot of chaplaincy work, that's how I... I was introduced to her through one of her sons. Anyway, she lived in this little tiny apartment that was odd-shaped right next to the railroad station. It was like a one-and-a-half bedroom, and the rooms were kind of, like I said, odd-shaped. I would drive past there. I would think of her all the time, and I visited her not as much as I wanted to, because I would always pass it, and it looked so dismal and so sad. And I would think of her, and I would think of her all alone. And I remember one day saying, I got a visitor. I can't put it off. So I go, and I knock on a door, and she's like, oh, pastor, good to see you. Come on in. And I walked through the threshold, and I just, I felt terrible. I'm like, look at, this is, she's all alone. And she saw it on my face. And she said, Pastor, what's the matter? She said, come, sit down. And I sat down at her little table. And she stood up and she said, so every morning I get up and I sit here in this chair. And uh, I invite Jesus to sit down next to me. And Jesus sits down next to me and we have breakfast. And then after breakfast, I'll clean up and, and then I'll go inside and I'll get my knitting and I'll sit down on my little couch and, and I invite Jesus to sit down and Jesus sits with me while I do my knitting. And then she said, come here and she showed me her simple bed. And she said, when I lay down at night, I lay down here and I ask Jesus to lay down next to me. And he lays down right next to me. It's really hard for me to even share this without crying myself. The most beautiful, profound, faithful statement that I've ever encountered in individual sharing. At that moment, I, the pastor, really became the parishioner. She became my pastor, reminding me of this profound truth that's grounded in our understanding of God's love. Brothers and sisters, don't lock our Lord out of your apartment, out of your house, out of your heart, out of your life. I know if you have a surprise guest, sometimes you don't want to let him in because the place is a mess. Or is that just me? <laughs> Jesus doesn't care about your mess of, your, of a life. Jesus cares about you. Jesus loves you. God really wants you to 
to thrive and enjoy the life that was intended for you. One that is filled with peace and strength and purpose. And God is always ready to show up for you and give you what you need. But that means that we got to come clean. That means we can't keep that little corner that we don't want to let God in. That means we got to let God walk through all of our sin and help us. That means right after you raise your voice and act in a way that you're not happy about or you do something which you know is wrong, you need to stop. And you need to say right there, God, I need you. This is not who you intended for me to be. If during this Lent you treat this as a retreat, as a time in the wilderness, as a time with God, I will tell you, the wild beasts that are out there will have no power over you. And the angels will minister to you. And with you. And in your own walk, and in your own ministry, in your own actions as God's child, as you extend the love of God, which you have been given to others, you will see miracles happen. You will see people come alive. People recognize Christ in you. And that's the life that God wants for you. And that's the life that God has enabled for us to share in, in Jesus. But we can't do it on our own. We need thee every hour, right? So, brothers and sisters, this Lent, join with me in this wilderness in calling on the Lord relentlessly so that our faith can be built up and the world can be transformed. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand. Trusting in God to reconcile all things. Let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. Please be seated. God, our truth, the ark of your church has room for many expressions of faith. We give thanks for voices that challenge and awaken your people especially that of Martin Luther, who we commemorate today. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our maker, you remember your covenant with the earth and its inhabitants. Rescue communities and creatures hurting from natural disasters. Preserve species and habitats endangered by human carelessness and disregard. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our light. You know our weakness. Free all who govern from the temptations of power. Sustain all who work for human rights in every nation, but especially in Russia, Ukraine, Israel, and Gaza. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our help. You care for your beloved children. Comfort all who are grieving, ill, afraid, in pain, or in despair. Feed hungry people living in food deserts. Protect any at risk from exploitation and abuse. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our home. You gather your people. Grant us health and safety as we assemble. Give us mind, keep us mindful of any who are homebound, hospitalized, convalescing, traveling, or struggling in any way especially those on our prayer list and those we name before you now aloud or in our hearts. We pray for the people of Russia, especially those grieving Alexei Navalny. Hear us, O God. Your mercy, Your mercy is great. God, our hope. You promise eternal life to your beloved children. We remember with gratitude those who have lived and died in faith. Grant that we may also dwell with you in everlasting peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy, Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Please rise. The peace of Christ be with you always. Peace of the Lord be with you. Peace be with you, Tom. Good.
Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached the good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which you shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection and ascension, we await for his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share in this heavenly food, the body and blood of Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. All are welcome. Come to the table of the Lord. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world.
I invite the congregation to please rise. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. your hearts and receive a blessing. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and grant you peace. Peace, share your bread. Thanks be to God.